Really see, build together a sequence of 
our facility that for uh, three days for training camp. And the amount of planning that goes into, but they got a game on Monday. They have a game on Monday. And they started on Tuesday morning. Okay? And, and they got a two-day practice schedule, and they came over on, uh, let's see, what came over on, uh, I guess they came over last Friday, and he walked through the facility, okay, we got this number of stations, we got these number of baskets, we got these number of this many players, let's, let's put together this plan, all right, folks, you're going to be here, you're going to take your guys through this door here, and there's a master plan of how they're going to function, okay? And then we're going to teach these things in the morning, bam, 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 we're going to come back at night, and then we're going to add this, bam, bam, bam. And the next day, we're going to go to step two, offensively, okay? And then uh, uh, defensively, we're going to review this. And, but there was a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sequence of how they're teaching things. I think that's critical for you guys, too. And the more organized you are on the front end, the less confusion you'll have with your players. And so really building together a sequence of when you're going to teach certain things is important. Most times... Most times, you, you know, you cannot win, okay? You cannot win a game zero to zero, okay? You cannot win a game zero to zero. There is a scoreboard that keeps track of points, okay? There's some bitches in the back that want to keep track of, they want to practice all fans, okay? Okay? They want to they, they practice all fans, okay? We know that, okay? We know that. But, all right, you, you darn sure, all right, you win a lot of games with great defense, okay? Uh, but, once you figure out how you're going to plan, then, then you get to the, each specific practice. And how are you going to plan that practice? Now, this is going to sound maybe out of balance to you. I don't know. Uh, I think that if you have a two-hour practice, it should take you two hours to write it up and plan it out. If we're going to have a two-hour practice, okay, it should take you at least two hours to really map it out and, and put it together exactly as you want to. I spent one year at the University of Kansas with Coach Williams, who's now in Carolina, a master of using every second of the, of, the, of the practice. I mean, he's just a master of using every second of the practice. So really sitting down and planning, all right, your practice is important. We time our drills, okay? Uh, we have a layup series that we do. We call it the Daily Dozen. It's kind of an old school thing that some older coaches have done. Coach Boyd probably, he probably was invented after he started coaching because he's been around so long. But, we time it every year, okay? Last year it took us eight minutes to do it. <coughs> Last year it took us eight minutes to do it. So when we write our practice plan out, that drill is scheduled for eight minutes. It's scheduled for eight minutes. It takes us seven minutes to stretch, okay? So we don't put ten minutes down to stretch because it's cleaner to put ten minutes, seconds over. We put seven minutes down. It's going to take seven minutes. <coughs> this next one is going to take eight minutes, okay? So now we have to work 15 minutes after those two drills. And we plan to the minute. All right, to the minute uh, about how, how we're going to function in practice. The football coach at Kansas State is a guy named Bill Snyder. And Dan there beat Auburn a couple weeks ago, but he took over the worst football program in the history of the world uh, at Kansas State. They lost like 37 in a row. Uh, and and uh, he's, he's just a meticulous, meticulous guy. As he was building the program, he went to the guy that planned to travel one day and he says, Coach, he says, you've got to call the airline. And they said, what for? He says, you need to see if they can fly a little faster. I need two more minutes for them to get here. So think about that. This guy's taking it to 150 football players, some are player rotating, he's coming down, he needs two more minutes. You know, he needs two more minutes. And, and he was serious about that. You know, and, and uh, but planning each specific practice, I think, is, is really a skill. You know, Dean Smith used to sit down the night before at his home map out the next day's practice, okay? And then wake up the next morning, go back over again, you know, reconfigure, then go to his staff and say, what do you guys think of this? And he spent a couple hours planning his practice. We do the same thing, okay? Now, when you do practice, okay, and you're planning your practice, okay, you got to evaluate how many buckets do you have, how many workstations do you have, okay? How many coaches do you have that may run a station? All right, how many balls do you got? How many players do you have? Take all that stuff into consideration, all right, is critical, all right, because there's nothing worse, I think, than having a drill and you got one guy shooting and you got nine guys in line, okay? And that just drives me absolutely insane, okay? I mean, how, you could easily, if you got one, one guy shooting and nine guys in line, you could easily get it to eight by making one guy a passer, okay? You know, so now we've got eight guys in line, there's two guys doing something. How do you structure your 
drill in a way to become efficient. Okay, how do you develop your drills to become efficient? This is how we plan practice, okay? Everyone here is crunched for time. Everyone here is crunched for time. We no longer stretch as a team. Okay? We no longer stretch as a team. We, we stretch off the, the uh, iPad, okay? We got an iPad video that plays, we got a screen, you know, in our gym, but it plays on a loop, and it's a seven minute stretching routine, okay, but it plays on a loop, and when you get in the gym, you go to the, you go to the screen, you start stretching. So if a guy wants to be there early, get some work done, he can stretch, and the, the, the responsibility of the team is that you better be stretched and ready to go by 3 p.m. That's our start time. So we've eliminated the stretch time with our team, all right, uh, most days by using the iPad. But we stretch. We always work on fundamental skills first. Okay? We always work on fundamental skills first. I think this is the, the this is the greatest athletic generation of basketball players that I think we've ever seen. Would you agree, Coach Lester? We got better athletes now than we've ever seen. Okay? We got the worst fundamentals that I've ever seen.
Right, we defend. You must have a primary defense that is great. You, and you or you will not win. Okay. Now, in the NBA, they're going to go into every game. They're going to say, "How are we playing defense transition? How are we defending the post? How are we playing the pick and roll?" If I was coaching in high school, the first thing I would do is build my transition defense. If you just take away people's fast break layups and all the little nasty buckets that people get, you're like, damn, maybe you'd be stunned at how effective you can be. Think about this and go back to your stats and look at it if you're this detailed. You're a two guard. How many offensive rebounds does your two guard get? You know? I'm, I, I, I show up, I pulled off a stick right out of the Okay? We get about one a game. Offensive rebound. One offensive rebound a game from the two guard. So if that's one rebound, that's one more possession. If we're shooting 50%, that's one, you know, that's one point. You go into the glass, God, that's one point. You get in your ass back with the point guard that's going to save us like eight. So the differential is like plus seven. So I guess what? Your, your days as an offensive rebounder are done. Okay? So getting, you know, Getting two guys back. And I think I think if you want to be a like if I was coaching in the summer, I know a lot of you guys summer basketball drives you crazy. Okay, I think you could I think you could win the damn summer championship. Okay, which by the way they don't give you rings or hang banners for. Okay, but if you just get back in transition defense. Okay, you would win every game. You would get every. But trans, how are you going to defend in transition? Now, as we at, at our level, there's about three or four ways to do it. Okay. There's about three or four ways we can do it. All right, how are you going to defend in transition? Okay, that, I think that's critical. All right, that you that you that you have that that plan in place and that you work on it early in practice. These dudes will be here. What what, what kind of clinic is going to give today? Four o'clock. These dudes will still shoot the ball at four o'clock. I promise you, these cats will. Now they won't want to be playing at ND at four. They will. They will. They will shoot the ball at four o'clock. Okay. So same thing holds true in practice. We do the defense first. Okay. Before there's any critique that creeps in, we, we're going to get out of guard. Okay. And we're going to go fundamental development first in practice. Then we're going to work on our defense. And you've got to have a primary defense that becomes great. Okay. For us.
Don't forget about that in scouting. How can we score? How can we get baskets? How can we get to the free throw line? How are we going to get some points on the board? Okay, now, obviously, as you game plan, okay, as you game plan, you've got to figure out how to stop the other team. Okay, how are you going to defend the other team? You know, looking at what they run, yes. Looking at their personnel, you know, having some idea. Now, for us, I mean, there, you can go to Synergy or whatever, they got stuff listed, but this guy goes right to the center China, this guy does, you know, having some idea of their personnel's tendencies is important. And it can really help separate uh, as you develop your defensive game plan. But, you know, putting together a plan, how you can score, how you can get stops is important. I think you also have to plan for the, the unknown. What happens if little Johnny gets in foul trouble? What are we going to do? Okay. Who is your emergency point guard? You got three point guards on your team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You know. You know. I am. You know, probably not. Now, when I did for the Georgia job. I didn't think Georgia had any point guards. And so as I sat there and talked with everybody, I said, I'll take we have a point guard one on the team. Dustin Ware ended up starting at the point, and he, and he ended up finishing his career as a kind of a really tiny two guard. You know? Maybe don't have a point. Okay? But John Wood and Bill Jackson combined for like 21 championships, and they put out of a two guard front. They put out of a two guard front with no true point. Okay? So there's a way to plan for that if you don't have one. But in today's game, with as much ball screen action as we see, you got to have a primary handler. Okay, maybe that's your point guard. Or who's point guard one? He's in, he's in foul trouble. Here's point guard two. Damn, he just got needed in the thigh. He's out. Where's my emergency? Who's my emergency guy? Who is it? We still trying to figure that out. All right. You know, but you got you got to have a plan in place for stuff like that. What happens if your only big guy gets a gets a really weak foul in the first 30 seconds of the game? You know, and then and then two minutes later gets a blocking foul, he's got two fouls, and you're not happy through the first quarter yet. What are you going to do when that happens? You better plan right now as to what we're gonna do. Okay, so I think I think you know as you go into games having some idea of of, of what you know, you're going to do, what your plan is, is important. And also trying to figure out what do you think they're going to do to you? And what do you think they're going to do to you? How are they going to try and play us? All right, so you can have a counter in play. Okay? All that being said, at the end of it, at the end of it, okay, Tom Coughlin is the head coach of the New York Giants. And he calls it midstream adjustment. When you get some curveball in the middle of the game, Oh, we want more plan for this. All right, scrap this plan and we're going to go over here. But I think also at the, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, you've got to reevaluate your plan. How is my team doing? Can we really play this way and win? Do we need to change it? Is this kid not playing as well as we had, had a plan he would play? Do, does, that, does that force us now to change our plan? All right, I think you've got to reevaluate that stuff. And halfway through the, 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 the season, once every two weeks, reevaluate, hey, how are we trying to, how are we really trying to play and be successful? Okay? And so I think that's, that's important too. But all this comes back to planning for the how. How are we going to win? Okay? How are we going to win? We do that. We got some more points than we got. We got to defend. Oh, yeah, really? That, that, that's that guy that sports radio. Okay? <coughs> With all the answers and no solutions. Okay. Yeah, we know what we got to do when it's effect. Well, how are we going to do that? Okay. How are we going to do that? You know, Kentucky had a great team two years ago, won the national championship. We were the only team to hold under 60 points the entire season. You know, the only team to hold under 60 points. And they scored 57. And, you know, that took a hell of a plan to try and figure that out. Okay. We figure out the other thing. But it's important for you to have some idea of what you want to do, of how you can do it, okay, how you can do it. So that, that's an important plan. Um, any questions on that before I go to some nice and Any questions on that? Okay, one. Um, ball screen or 
are so prevalent in today's game. Okay? Ball screens are so prevalent in today's game. Your ball screen coverage, okay, defensively is, is important. And there's many ways, I think those will talk about it later today, okay? The bottom line with ball screen offense is, is, is your ball screen offense, okay, must be good enough to draw in a third defender. Otherwise, it's not good enough ball screen offense. Let me say that again. If you're, if you're a pick and roll action or a pick and pop action, your ball screen offense, if it is not good enough to draw in a third defender, then that ball screen action is not good enough. Okay? It is not good enough. What you'll see in the NBA, all right, is when there's ball screens, okay, and there's when, when you can get a team into rotation and bring a third defender in, then when you get the ball on the other side of the floor, you have all the advantages, and that's where people score. <clears throat> Let's go back to the NBA finals. You've got the greatest athletes on the Miami Heat who were just feasting on teams that would come down, set offense, get to a pick and roll, bam, they hit you, all right, and, and with their ball screen defense, and then out of their rotations and speed, all right, they, 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 just, they just hate you up. You go to the Spurs, okay, with the one with his old guys, and they get that ball moving so that the, the, uh, the Heat can't set their defense and eat that ball screen up, okay, and all of a sudden they don't have to defend it. If you're going to be a ball screen team and you've got ball screens on in, in your in your in your offense, that screen and roll action must be good enough to draw the third defender. Okay? If it's not, ultimately it won't be good enough to win. Okay? Now, how are you going to guard ball screens? Okay? I, I don't think there's a lot of ball handling. Okay? Think about this. How many guys can dribble the ball off a ball screen and make a three-point shot against the You got to who has one on their team? But we thought it was a pretty good dude. Okay? There's not a lot of ball handlers, okay, who can come off a ball screen and make a three-point shot. That, that, especially if, if, if you play any, any kind of forceful defense where the ball screen is, is, is a, just a half step outside the operational area. There's not very many guys who can come off a ball screen and shoot three. So think about that as you structure your defense of the ball. Does that guy really need a big hedge? Do we really need to go over the top on that guy? Alright. You know, I think I think that's really something to evaluate when you start game planning how we're going to guard ball strength. Alright, obviously we're all still hunting the open three. We're all still hunting layups and we're all hunting free throws. If you can get those three things Get three. If we win a battle of threes, if we win a battle of free throws, if we get more left than they do, we're going to win. Okay? <clears throat> Where are the three-point shots coming from in high school basketball? Penetration, pitch, right? Most of them are off the catch. There's very little dribble three-point shot. Okay? There's very, that's one of the reasons contagious with number eight, because he could come up there. Okay? So, you got to keep that in mind as you're playing your ball screen defense, okay? We got to, all right, that, that's, that's, a, that's an effective way to play. A lot of people in the NBA playing that way, okay? All right, I think you've got to be able to mix it up okay, based on who you're playing against, okay? Uh, but if you talk about ball screen defense, there's really two areas of the court where you've got to decide how you're going to defend the ball screen. We have a side ball screen. Anything that happens on the side, okay, may have one coverage. Okay? Because you've got a help side established. Anything in the middle of the court, okay, in the middle alley, okay, would, would likely be a very different coverage because you don't have the help side established. Okay? And so, here we go. So, okay. so I got a
if you if you're outside of the operational area, okay? I, mean, I don't know why you can guard the ball where they can't score from. I really don't. Unless you're trying to create turnovers, why would you guard the ball where they can't score from? Think about that. I mean, it don't make a whole lot of sense. You know, obviously, So, you got this player, I started off a few minutes ago, that, that cannot score. So, 
So why guard them if they step away from the basket, right? Why not just put that person in the lane, the, the one man zone? And then they come back to you, they, they come back to you. Okay? So that's how we would do it. And, you know, I tell you one of the, the ballsiest moves ever is, is uh, Coach Knight at Indiana uh, played in the Final Four in the UNLV. Keith Smart's a very dear friend of mine. And uh, Keith is now an assistant to the Miami Heat. He was the MVP of the Final Four that year. They played, they played UNLV in the, in the semifinals, and they did not guard a point guard named Mark Wade from UNLV. Did not guard him. Did not, just stood in the basket and said, you come in here, we'll pick you up. That took a lot of courage to do that. To think about going to a game and say, we're not guarding this player. Okay? Now, I'll be honest with you, as an offensive player, when that happens to you, that messes your mind up. Okay. You know, they don't guard me. Uh, really? That's an indictment on your game. Okay? <laughs> Because 
No, he's blind. You know, so if he's moving at all, it's illegal. So he, he, he can't, the defender can't see him. Okay? So we got about two or three ways to go off the market flat and the flat ball straight up top. Number one, sorry, you want to set that? We're gonna we're gonna blitz you and trap you every time. We're gonna take two guys, we're gonna trap that ball. So you wanna come to that, give the trap every time. And then try someone up back behind. So one would be trap. Number two, which is done mostly in the NBA, but again, the way they can space the floor, their skill level and their defensive rules, they always push a guy to, the, to his weak hand. Okay, to his weak hand. And usually, usually, are fine giving up a contested 15-footer and just taking that guard, forcing him to his, to his left, okay, taking away the three and forcing him to a contested 15-footer. Right, that's how we would do it all the time, okay? Um, if the guy's a pick and pop player up top, uh, or there's role replacing, okay, we go one big in the hole. You know, we, we, we trap that guy, go one big in the hole, and let the big hit the edge just to replace him. We got a uh, call that a fly switch, it's a role replace, if it's a pick and pop, you just get back to your own hand. But, but, but that, that, that's, that's how we would guard him, you know, that's how we would guard him. And, and I, think, I think if you just go blitz the guy, Guys don't want to be, first of all, they oftentimes run that and get the shot clock for us. In the clock, yeah, oh, Boston, come get me. All right, we're going to trap you. And now you start this ball screen at 6 or 7 o'clock. We're going to trap you. You're the guy who wants to score. And now you've got to go with somebody else who's not the primary option. And now you've got two or three seconds for that guy to score. We'll take our chance. Here we go. Okay, if he can't, okay, if he can't, we'll turn right here and run him. 
vertical pin down right there. And this guy's not in position to step up here and take away from him. I'm with you right there. You know? And the case is very good at that. See if you catch a shoot. Okay? Um, but, but that's that's